this is the wrong song, bro. Oh, did he? Good evening. Good to see everybody. We want to have our announcements again and, and say a prayer as we get started tonight for some of our sick. I uh, want to welcome our visitors and uh, stick around let us get to know you. Congratulations to Art and Mary Phillips on the birth of, of a grandson, Colin. Frederick Phillips, born on August 26, weighed 7 pounds and 7 ounces and 20 and a half ounces long. Proud parents are Jason and Tiffany Phillips. Welcoming, calling home is big sister Kamala. Susan Miller requests prayers for a friend. Uh, Jim Stewart, he fell and broke his hip and had surgery yesterday. Please pray for healing for him. We want to uh, remember uh, David and Pauline McKinney is there at home now and Pauline's taking care of David we need to pray pray for them and Mary Phillips as she's recu recuperating from her broken wrist and Mario and Margaret Hernandez that are recuperating from from their uh, wreck that they had a month or so ago Margaret's still recuperating Mario was here this morning the the war in, in Ukraine and uh, no, we have some ill we're not even aware of in our shut-ins and our missionaries and our military. So let's, let's have a prayer as we get started tonight for all of our sick. So let's pray at this time. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this time we can be together and, and worship you once again tonight. And uh, Father, we have many that are sick. And um, we also ask that you heal them with Susan Miller's friend Jim Stewart and be with David and Pauline McKinney and Mary Phillips and Mario and Margaret Hernandez and uh, heal them Father if it be your will and uh, be with our missionaries around the world to protect them our shut-ins and, and we know that there's there, some that are sick that we don't even know about and we need to pray for them and um, be mindful of them and our freedom. We thank you so much for the freedom in, in this great land and country we live in. And we pray we'll always have this freedom and this peace. And uh, we just pray a special prayer for our leaders of this country. We pray that, that they'll look to you for wisdom and knowledge as our forefathers always have. Put you first and and so we can remain free and be an example to the whole world of what freedom is. And uh, so be with us tonight, Father, as, as we worship you, as we sing songs of praise to you and, and worship your holy name. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Our first song tonight will be uh, We Praise the Old God, number two. Uh, I'll be singing from the book that we have in the auditorium. And from what uh, the, this version up here will be from that same book. So we'll be on the same page if you're looking up here. But if you want to use the books that are in here, that list on the right is the list of songs we're doing tonight. So you can, you can use the book if you want to there. So, let's begin with, we praise thee, O God, number two. <clears throat> Excuse me. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus, who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. 
We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has brought us and, and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Number 286. Wonderful story of love. Number 286. After this song, Brother Eddie Reed will be leading us in prayer. <clears throat> Wonderful story of love. Tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it, shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love, wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, though you are far away, wonderful story of love, still he doth call today, calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation, Wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, Jesus provides a rest, wonderful story of love, for all the pure and blessed. Rest in those mansions above us, with those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus, wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love. If you would join me in prayer. Our God and our Father, we give you thanks and honor. We give you the glory. We want to thank you for each and every blessing that you give us each and every day. 
Help us to always be mindful that everything we have comes from you, that we don't have anything that we have generated ourselves. Lord, and you, you bless us greatly beyond imagination and belief. Help us to always use these things wisely and help us to always be mindful of the creation that we live in. We've prayed for rain. You have sent it, and your creation springs forth. It shows us how great it is and how you sustain everything. Lord, we'd ask that you'd send more rain, continue to fill the lakes and the streams, and Lord, show us your great power. Show us your control over everything that you've created and even our lives. Keep us focused on you. Lord, and touch our hearts so that they're soft, that we're never hardened, that we're always receptive to your word when it's encouraging, when it's correcting, and when it's convicting. Lord, be with us now. Help us to sing praises to your name. Be with us, but most of all, Lord, forgive us of our sins, and it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Number 524, 524, I know whom I have believed. <coughs> Excuse me. After this song, the Lord's Supper is prepared for those who would like to partake of it. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, created faith in Him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me, of weary ways or golden days before his face I see. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day.
the table's been left prepared for all those that are willing or wanting to take it this, this evening. Uh, if you'll raise your hand whenever we uh, are finished praying, uh, somebody from the back will serve you. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for all that you do. Lord, we know that without you coming to this earth, Lord, and teaching us and going to that cross, Lord, that we would have no forgiveness of sins. Lord, we know that this bread that we are going to partake of, Lord, that, that reminds, me of, reminds us of that body, Lord, that uh, was hung upon that cross, Lord, that was precious, Lord. We knew it, that you knew no sin, but you took upon the sin of this world, Lord. We just want to say thank you for that. Lord, we know that, that you died that day, Lord, uh, taking all that weight upon you, Lord. But the, we know the story didn't end there. We know that you arose again, Lord, and are alive today and able to, to intercede for us. And we just want to say thank you for that, Lord. Please be with us as we partake of these emblems, Lord. And we, may we always do it in a manner that's well-pleasing in your sight. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, once again we come to you and with just asking you, Lord, to, to be with us, Lord. Help us to remember all that you've done for us, Lord, as we were take this fruit of the vine, Lord, which represents to us that blood that was shed on that cross for us, Lord. May we do it in a manner that's well-pleasing to you, Lord, and we, we always remember what that blood has bought us. It's through Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes Lord's Supper, but uh, at this time we'd like to have a prayer for collection. There is a plate in the back if you would uh, like to, to, to give, uh, and then also, of course, we have the online app uh, as well. So uh, would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for all that we have. Lord, we know that without you, Lord, we'd have no hope of everlasting life, but we also know that all the good things that we have in this life are from you. Lord, we know that the money, the things that we have here, Lord, just tools that we need to use, Lord, to bring others into your kingdom. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to, to use this money that's collected, Lord, in a, in a manner that's pleasing to you. May we always use it, Lord, to spread your word throughout this community and throughout this world. Thank you so much, Lord, again, for all that you are and do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next song will be number 778, Be With Me, Lord, number 778. Flashing seas 
leap everywhere about me. They cannot harm or make my heart afraid. Be with me, Lord, no other gift or blessing thou couldst bestow could with this one compare a constant sense of thy abiding presence where i am to feel that thou art near be with me lord when loneliness o'ertakes me when i must weep Amid the fires of pain, and when shall come the hour of my departure for worlds unknown? O Lord, be with me. Number 453 will be our song before our lesson tonight. Number 453. If it's convenient for you, let's stand together as we sing this song. 453. <clears throat> love, love lifted me. 453. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful loving service to, to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves, he will lift you by his love out of the angry wave, he's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Thank you. Be seated, please. Then
Rock of Ages. All right, good evening, church. All right, so this morning we got into the idea that there's some words that we need to reclaim as Christians, and, and that's, the, that's the challenge that we have, right, is we've been uh, commissioned to go and to preach and teach. We've been told to preach the truth, all right, whether the world agrees with it or not, we've been given a message to preach, and, and so a part of this is speaking the words that God has given us to speak, and so there's words that we have to be able to give and speak that even though the world may see them meaning one thing, we have the obligation to teach and to, and to preach and to introduce them to the truth the way that God would have it. This morning we looked at the word revival and what it means for us to be revived again and to be restored. And we looked at Holy Spirit conviction and we looked at calling on the Lord or calling on the name of the Lord. Things that you don't necessarily hear sometimes within the circles of the Church of Christ. Even though we all know what it is and we know we need to do it, we shy away from it because those are words that are typically associated with different beliefs, different uh, um, denominations. So we don't want to be associated with it, so we distance ourselves from it. But rather than distance, we need to meet it head on, and we need to teach, and we need to re-educate, and when we come across these words, we cannot be afraid to get into the scripture and to show people what this really means and why it's important as it pertains to our relationship with God, and this morning we left off on baptism, and so that is, is one that, as you all know, this, this, this one act of obedience, this one moment of surrender has caused more division amongst people that call themselves believers than just about anything else. And so why is it, though, why is it that this one act, this one single work, this one moment of surrender, why does it cause division and ultimately the loss of countless souls? Well, I, I go back to the garden 100% of the time. Because it has everything to do with man's willingness to surrender to anyone else's will other than their own. We don't like being told what to do, do we? We don't. It's not in our nature to be like, how may I help you? Unless you work at Chick-fil-A. Those are special people. you know. But uh, everybody else, we just don't wake up in the morning and say, how may I serve you today? It is my pleasure to serve you. It's not in our nature to want to be told what to do. So you go back even to the garden, and when it comes to, to God saying, of this tree thou shalt not eat. Right? God has only ever given us the things that pertain to life. The things that pertain to godliness. Right? That's Second Peter chapter 1, verse uh, 3. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Peter's reminding us that God has done everything for us so that it is to our benefit. Right, have you ever loved your children and wanted the best for your children and tried to rear them in a direction you wanted them to go because you knew it was the safe route to go, it was going to keep them, you know, untainted and safe and clean and, and, and but then they just fight with you because they think that you're just doing it because you want to be the boss of them and you're like you know you don't get it I'm, I'm setting you up for success god set us up for some for success in the very beginning but what did what did satan do he goes to eve and he goes well well i know what god told you but but you know, but, but it's what he didn't tell you and so that that one thought enters your mind and you're like well you mean there's something i don't know you mean i've been held back from something you mean somebody god kept something how dare he right and he's like yeah the moment you eat of this fruit you become just like him and so the desire came the one thing that god said if you just trust me and love me this is for your benefit but because of our own desire not to be served by anybody but to have our own will met, we rebel. But God doesn't give us conflicting information. See, that's what Satan wanted in the garden. He wanted Eve to think that God gives conflicting information. You can't trust this guy. And so that's even what happens in the Bible today. People debate about baptism, and you can show them all the different verses and conversion stories about baptism, and they'll still go to one verse and take it completely out of context and say, but see here, it says all you got to do is believe. And you're like, God is not the author of confusion. We mess it up. 
That's what Paul reminds the Corinthians. <laughs> he tells them, as what he says, God is not the other confusion in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, but of peace in all the churches of the saints. He's not going to tell you to do something here and then contradict it here. That's why the whole argument that, that the gospel of Paul was different than the gospel of Peter, to me, is just one of the most ridiculous arguments that I've ever heard because they both, both preach the very same message as it pertains to salvation through Christ. John, in John chapter 3, verse 3 and 5, he records his conversation with Jesus as he's having this, this rooftop conversation with Nicodemus, and he tells him here, you cannot see nor can you enter the kingdom of heaven without being born, being reborn of water and spirit. And this idea that something has to happen, there has to be a moment. It's not about a physical birth. This is about something brand new in your life in which something happens to you. And there's this rebirth and Nicodemus doesn't understand it. And so he goes on and tells him about this. And you think about the things you can see and you, you ponder and you're supposed to be a teacher of the law. But it's been this way since the beginning. Jesus was the light to come in to shine thing, to, to shine and expose the darkness. And baptism is that essential moment in which we call upon the name of the Lord, like we talked about this morning. That is the actual calling on, the appeal to God for forgiveness of sins, the moment that we surrender. And we looked at Acts chapter 2 this morning, and Peter said to them in verse, two, thir uh, verse 38, Repent and be baptized after they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He didn't say, Well, call upon the name of the Lord. I just told you. Remember back in verse 21? He didn't say that. He said, No, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, not just some of you, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We looked at Acts 22 this morning and compared why some people get confused in Scripture, but as he... As Paul is, you know, uh, re recollecting this moment in which he had this conversation with Ananias when he came down that street called Straight, and he says, Why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, signifying the fact that it's this moment in which you, you, you wash the sins away, that sins are forgiven. That's what Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, where he says, Baptism. I had a conversation with him once. With somebody, it wasn't that long ago, and this person looked directly at me, and they said, well, baptism doesn't save. And I said, except for that one pesky verse in the Bible where it actually says that it does save. It doesn't say that. Not in my Bible. Well, let me see your Bible. i got to take a look at this. I flipped her Bible right over to 1 Peter chapter 3.21 and said, please read this verse. Baptism, which now doth save. And she stared at that verse for about 20 minutes without saying anything, and then she'd go to speak. Well, so, because she was conflicted. Because she saw something that was never taught to her before. But that's what he says. He says, baptism, which corresponds, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt, it's not taking a bath. It's not washing the physical things off of you. It says, but it is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's a doorway that must be entered. I can invite you to my house, and I can cook you dinner. And I can say, come on over, be here at 6, and you can come up to the driveway, and you can stand at the door, and you can knock, and I can open it up and say, come on in and enjoy the feast we have prepared for you, but unless you walk through the door, you haven't come into my house. You haven't accepted the gift that has been prepared for you. There's a door. Baptism is the door because it's where we come in connection with Christ. And the world hates this. Because again, we want the fast food version of Christianity. We want to be able to just drive up and say, this is what I want. I don't want to have to do anything for it. don't want to have to wait for it. I want it and I want it now. 
And so the world introduces things like, well, all you got to do is believe. And when you believe and you call upon the name of the Lord and you accept Jesus into your heart and, and you say a prayer, then you're a Christian, you're a believer. The only problem is, and we're going to get to this in a little bit, people confuse salvation with belief. And they pair the two, and the two should be, they should be synonymous with one another, but the world separates it, and they, and they, they do so ultimately to their peril. Because what happens in baptism is we put on Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Colossians 2, 12, Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Taking you back to Romans chapter 6, in which you put the old self to death and you rise new. And it's at that moment, it's at that moment when you put on Christ that you can proudly wear the name Christian. We live in a, we live in a society right now, and, and Anne would argue with me on this fact because she has a much cooler maiden name than my last name. But we live in a world now that we want to normalize the idea that you don't have to belong to anybody. But what do you do when you marry somebody? Traditionally, what? The woman takes on the name of her husband because they become one flesh. Now, I grew up and people would say, that's, that's biblical. And I'm like, well, yeah, let's, let's, not, let's, let's not paint that picture with it. But the intent is there when you belong when you're one, why would you have different names? And so the idea is that when you take on a husband for the wives, they take on that name. They're one flesh. They're one person. They're one, so they combine their names. But there's a movement. On, and it's, 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 I mean, it, there's so many people out there in the de- now that don't even take on the last name of their husband that it's just normal now. But that's what the devil wants. That's what society wants because they want you to think you don't have to do anything for anybody else. You're your own individual. You don't... You're your own person. You're important enough. You don't need anything from anybody else. So when we take on the name Christian, it offends a lot of people because, again, you're saying that I have to surrender to somebody else. I'm not good enough on my own. And it offends people. But then again, the gospel is offensive, isn't it? But you take on the name Christian. And it's a name that we should bear, that, and we should, we should honor that name. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it said they were first called Christians at Antioch. Some people would say that this was a bad thing, that, that, that the, the, con- the connotation here would be that, that uh, they were identified for these, these rebellious people, these people that act a certain way, and, oh, you're a Christian. I choose to believe that it doesn't matter why they were called Christian but it was a name that they proudly bore because it identified them as a part of a body in which they belonged. I wonder who that first person was in Antioch that said that. If it, Maybe if it was a member of the church or maybe it was somebody that was speaking against them. I don't know, but I wonder what the reaction was the first time somebody said that. Oh, you're a Christian. I wonder if that person was like, you know, well, yeah, yes I am. I know I'm excited when people can look at me and they say, you must be a Christian. I'm also excited when people look at me and they say, oh, you must be a Christian. I get excited either way because it's a name that I gladly bear. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And God is love. He says, people are going to identify you as belonging to me. People are going to identify the mark that you wear of belonging to me, being a disciple of mine, if you love one another, because I am love. That's why in Galatians, chapter 3, 27 says, for as many of you who were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. 
I put on that name Christian because it is central to who I am after I have surrendered myself and given everything to Christ. To some, though, God would say this and Christ would say this. He posed the question in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, and I think he still poses it today to many people in the world. But why do you call me Lord and not do the things that I say? I've shared this with you all before. I grew up in a household where, where you know, my dad would tell us all the time, you have those things that your dad tells you and your parents tell you and they go out and they, they, they want you to remember something always, always, always. And the thing that I'll never forget my dad ever saying is he would always tell us, remember you're a miller. Remember who you are and what you stand for. Your name means something. Because he wanted us to, to, to go out and bring honor to our family. God does the same for us. He desires the same for us, that we would do His will. And when we do His will, people will identify us by the things that we do in which we are obedient to whom we belong. The name Christian means something. It means we've taken on the name of whom we belong. There's a lot of weight behind it. Believer. This is the one that I think we hear the most, right? Someone will say, are you a Christian? Or some even might say, well, I'm a believer. I think you can't be a Christian unless you're a believer, and I don't think you can be a believer unless you're a Christian. I don't think you can be a believer or a Christian unless you've been baptized. I think there's an order to this. John chapter 3, verse 16, following that conversation with Nicodemus, he gets down, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. People use that as a staple for the, the belief that they have, and all I have to do is believe in Jesus, because it says he gave his only begotten Son. It doesn't say that, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him and is baptized should not perish. I says, well, why would it have to say that? You're not going to get baptized if you don't believe. I don't know anybody that's like, you know what I need to do? I don't believe in God, but I need to have my sins forgiven through baptism. That doesn't exist. That's why in Acts chapter 3, Peter doesn't say repent and be baptized like he told him in Acts chapter 2, because they haven't repented yet. So Peter tells the people in Acts chapter 3 to repent. You need the conviction first before you can be baptized. A believer is somebody who does the Word of God, who's obedient to the Word of God. James chapter 1, verse 22, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Again, it's that fast food version. I, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna hear the Word. I'll listen to it all day long, and I, I love being affirmed of my faith. I love those affirmations that tell me I'm going to heaven. I love it when you assure me of my salvation, but don't tell me I've got to do anything. Don't you dare tell me I've got to do something. Because only Jesus could do it. Jesus says in John 14, verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. It says he will keep my word. If you're a believer, you're going to keep my word. That's why in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, the person that Jesus is talking about is somebody who believes in him. Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? This is somebody that's spent a, the, the majority of their life doing works, professing Christ. But in the end, because of disobedience, he doesn't associate them as a believer. He associates them as lawless. That's why you go back to John 14, a little bit before that verse in 23. In John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. See, those are the pesky verses for people that want to just have a believer's faith. 
The idea that we have to keep a commandment, that puts a lot of burden on me. That means I can't live life the way that I want to do it, and I just don't want to accept that gospel. Because Jesus came to, to love and forgive and have mercy and grace and peace, and, and that's who Jesus is. That's, that's the Jesus I want to love. Problem is, is that part of Jesus is true, but the Jesus that you, you worship there is an idol. Because you can't have that Jesus without also having the obedience, without having the commandments. The world is made to believe that belief is easy. That baptism is a work, that belief takes the work out of the picture. But Jesus knew better than that, didn't he? John chapter 6, verses 26 through 33. I want you to read this with me or just, or just listen. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set a seal upon him. And so Jesus says, you don't follow me because, because of the things that I'm doing. I have, you, I have been healing the sick. I've been doing all these miracles, and you're not even following me because of that. You're not convicted because you see the Son of God in front of you. You just want me to feed you. You want to follow me and get all the benefit without having to really believe in me. And so they, they, they answer back to him, and they said to him, well, what shall we do that we may know or we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent me. That's another one of those verses. Well, you know, you water salvationalists. You're saying that it's all up to you to go to heaven. You take Christ out of the picture and you say it's all on you. Nah. That's a works-based salvation. You've got to believe only. Okay, well, follow me to John. I'd like to introduce you to a verse that says that belief is a work. No. -uh. Yeah, right here. Read this. Okay. Well, it's... Uh. Well, nah, I don't believe it. Because we don't like to believe the things that we don't want to believe. We fight against it. Even though God tells us a time and time again what he expects from us. People want the easy way out. The only problem is, is there is no easy way out of this world. There's not. We're always going to be met with opposition. We're going to be met with persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, not might suffer persecution. He says you will suffer persecution because you're going to demand obedience to a God that they don't want to obey. Even if they call themselves a believer, they're going to fight you on it because they don't want to be obedient to God. They want to be obedient to the idea of God. But we have to have obedience. That's what Paul teaches the Thessalonians in his second letter. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 9 says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to re repay with tribulation those who trouble you and give you uh, who are troubled rest, when the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey God. So he takes the belief argument and throws it right out the window. He says, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You know what the lonely part about that verse to me is? It's not, I, I look at that verse and, and there's a lot of pain there. There says everlasting and fire and vengeance. There's a lot going on there. But perhaps the most painful aspect of this verse, the most painful thought of this, it says that you are out of the presence of the Lord. Meaning there is no more opportunity to call upon Him, to appeal to Him. I got two more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little bit brief here. 
because we've already gone over one of them before. We've got predestination. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. But it's a term we need to take back. We need to take back the term believer. We need to take back the term predestination. Some don't like it because of its abuse and the way that people look at it today, but we have to take it back. I think we have to reclaim it. Let's look at a, a couple verses real quick, and then we'll, we'll move on from this one. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by, uh, by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. You go down to verse 11 in chapter 1, it says, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things, according to the counsel of His will. Predestination in the biblical sense is that God has predestined an eternity with him. And those that will join him in eternity belong to a body in which Christ is the head. And that's going to be the church. That's what predestination is. That salvation is going to be offered through Christ. And those that accept the invitation, that those that act upon the appeal and appeal back those are the ones that are predestined. You and I today are predestined, not because God said, well, Robert Miller, hmm, okay, we're going to send him to the saved line. We're predestined because he said, I'm going to establish a church, the body of Christ, and those that belong in it are going to be predestined to go to eternity and be reunited with our Father. That's the predestination that we need to teach. It was never intended to be a doctrinal battleground or a tenet for debate. But when you see it in Scripture, it's meant to be an encouragement. He's in, every time you see it, it's an encouragement. It's a, Listen, guys, don't give up because you're predestined. You're in the church that was, was foretold back in the garden when Adam and Eve got kicked out. They talked about how... Through her seed, salvation was going to come. The devil would be destroyed. It was predestined that this would happen, and you're a part of it. It was meant to be encouraging. And the last one I want to talk about tonight real quick is one that I think is, it has become so normal. It has become so normal in society now that I don't know if we'll ever get it back. And everything so far has been kind of up to us, right? It has. It's kind of been up, up to us. If, if I'm having a conversation with people and they tell me that, you know, they called upon the name of the Lord and that they're saved, I can, I can teach them and I can show them what that really means. But I think this one takes a concentrated effort. And that is the name Pastor. That is the name Pastor. We have long given up on calling our elders pastors because the world would define it as the preacher, the person that stands up in front of people. And then they identify that person with the person that's leading them. We have to take this name back because it's a name with meaning. It's a name that has been given to a specific people for a specific commission. And we have to recognize it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, to the, the, the pastors, he says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Jesus spent some time talking about shepherding. In the 10th chapter of John, he makes this, this connection. And beginning in verse 7, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Remember what Jesus did though? Remember how Jesus talked? He made things understandable. 
He made things understandable so that people of every walk of life could listen to him and know the truth that he was speaking. And so he's talking here, and he says, All who hear, all who um, ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Remember, because in Acts, we're told of what? what Theodos, Judas of Galilee. That's a Bible Bowl question, folks, for kids, okay? <laughs> There's people that came before Jesus that said that they were the Messiah that came to nothing. He says, There are people that came before me. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And then listen to what he says. He says, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. There is no other good shepherd than Jesus. But Jesus helps the shepherds today understand their purpose in saying that you are there to protect the flock. And you are there to to know your sheep, and they need to know you. I think the name pastor has been given away. I don't think it was taken away. I think it was voluntarily given away. Because we live in a society in which a lot of people ask a lot of questions, and and it challenges our belief. And I think that that sometimes the things that we have to face in the world is just so much to bear that we would rather just somebody else do the job. And so I think when people start associating the pastors, the preacher, they saw it as an opportunity, so I don't have to do as much. We're going to let the the preacher counsel the flock. We're going to let the preacher teach the flock. And we gave it away to eager people that were willing to take it. Because again, people are eager for for self-will, for self-worship, right? And so how many people in the world will graciously accept that title of pastor even though they themselves are not a shepherd? And they want it because it makes them feel important, bigger than they are. Shepherds protect the flock from the wolves. That's what they do. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, that's what Paul says they're supposed to do. It says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He says, your job as pastors is to watch over and protect the flock. I think today we're too worried about a budget. And that's shepherding the flock. We're worried about the trivial things, the small things. And we're not focused on the things that we need to be focused on. It's time that we take back the name pastor. We can help teach that. And I'm guilty of it. Right? I'm guilty. There are times that people walk up to me and they'll say, they'll say, well, hey, 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 pastor. And and I just think to myself, they don't know any better. And so I'll answer their question. But then they walk away, and what have I done but affirm their belief in a false teaching? We all have to get better at it, myself included. The world is not going to know the truth unless the truth is brought to them. How can they hear unless somebody has taught? How can they be taught unless somebody's been sent? And we've all been commissioned to go and to preach. Let's reclaim these words. Let's teach the truth. Let's do so in love. And let's be known as a church that is proud of the verbiage that God has given us and not ashamed of it or or, or afraid and shy away from it. Let's teach it. And let's be bold about it. One of the best ways to oppose error is to uphold the truth. By employing these terms in their biblical sense, not only will we be speaking the truth, but very likely 
we'll be opening the doors of communication for others to be introduced to the truth. And that's the goal, to bring others to Christ, to bring them to truth so that they know how to call upon the Lord, so they can be revived, so they can be convicted by the Spirit, so they can become believers, Christians immersed in baptism, brought into the body, added to the church by God, forgiven of their sins for the price that was paid by Christ on the cross, and hoping for the salvation that is before us. If there's anyone here this evening who's a prayer as a congregation, we can pray for you this evening. Maybe you're watching and, and you've heard some of these terms. Maybe the, you've been confused about it. Maybe you've said, well, you know, I've never really thought about that before. That's where communication starts. I hope and it starts a discussion. I hope that you can go out and find conversations in which some of these terms are being used and you can say, oh, you know, we just, we just were talking about that in church the other day. Did you know? And open a door for communication for people to be introduced to Christ. If you need to be introduced, we can do that now. We'd love to talk with you. We've got a whole congregation filled with preachers and teachers that are ready to teach. Maybe you're ready to be baptized. We can baptize you tonight. Just because the baptismal is over in the building we're not using in the evening services because it's hot doesn't mean we won't fire up those lights and, and put you in the water so God can add you to his church. The invitation is yours this evening for anyone as together we stand and sing. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. While I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Brother Mark Tullis will be leading us in our closing prayer tonight. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thankful for this day to be here to worship you. Father, we're thankful for Brother Brother Robert and his message, both messages that he's brought today, reminding us of things that we have in you that we've forgotten or that we haven't held on to or we haven't held as truths things that we need to reclaim. Father, we're thankful that you hold, sta hold steadfast the promises that you've given to us. We're thankful for your son that you've given to us and the power and the salvation that lies with him. Father, we ask that you be with each and every family that's represented here tonight. Watch over them. Father, we have many that, that are sick, and uh, we ask that you be with each and every one of those, those that have lost loved ones. Uh, Father, we 
ask that you bless this food that we are about to eat. And uh, Father, we ask that you continue to send rain whenever you see fit. We see the beautiful benefits of it, and we've seen the lack of it. Uh, Father, we just beseech you to continue to, to send it whenever you see fit. Father, continue to bless this congregation here as we bless you. Pray all this through your son's name. Amen.